It's, um, this is kind of a cozy group over here and kind of spread out, but it's good to, good to have everybody, some of you back from um, being restricted. No, I'm not making a move. I wouldn't do that. We wouldn't know. Somebody, somebody told me, oh, it's Denny. I sat in the wrong spot in Sunday school and she was really concerned why I wasn't here. And I just like moved one section. So Doug, stay there so we know that you're here. Um, uh, just a couple of quick announcements. This is our Missions <laughs> Emphasis Month. There is a, a um, RSVP slash flyer in the back, so if you grab one of those and fill that out about your plans to attend our Missions Conference weekend at the end of the month. So sign up for numbers coming, meals that you would like to um, be present for, nursery needs if you have those, and um, help if you're willing to help. We need help in all those areas. We also are not, this is not a budgeted item for us, so if you wish to give to the missions um, weekend, please do that. Just make a note, memo note, um, and, and put that in the offering for us. We'd appreciate that. If you have any other questions about missions conference or helping your missions at the church, please see me and, um, and let me know. I'm going to pray for us first, and then I'll introduce our speaker. So let's pray. Father, quiet our hearts before you. This is your work that you are doing here. Thank you for doing that in our presence, for including us in it, for allowing us to serve. We praise you for your loving patience, your goodness, the richness of how you bless us. We confess our sins, Lord. Remove those things that would be obstacles to what your will is for this body this morning. Speak to and through Mark as he comes to share the work that you're doing in prison ministry. Be glorified in this time, we pray. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Mark Andrews is with Metanoia, which is the Mission North America um, prison ministry for the PCA. We actually got to hear Mark speak at a presbytery meeting. It was fantastic. I was very excited, and so I found him quickly to get him signed up for this, and I've bugged him for a few months since then. So Mark and his wife Pat have come to be with us this morning, and Mark's going to come share. years now. We have uh, uh, six kids and 12 grandchildren, and um, we actually didn't come to Christ. I'll tell you a little bit about my background until later in life. Um, I was actually raised in an alcoholic home. Um, uh, it was fairly dysfunctional, and when I was 14, I started doing drugs. We did almost every drug you could do, and when I was 17, my parents kicked me out of the house. They said, do what we say or get out of the house, so I got out. Um, at that time, there wasn't many options. I was trying to go to high school, watching pots and pans in a country club, and trying to think of places to spend the night. Uh, so I joined the Navy, and I uh, traded an authority structure that I thought was impressive to one that truly was. <laughs> um, so the first guy, I, I remember uh, I had long hair. It was back in the day, you know, where hippies uh, uh, had long hair. And, and I, I came to the realization of that, uh, that, that uh, authoritative structure when after my dad had been talking to me for years about cutting my hair and I didn't cut it, they were just peeling my head like a grape in, in boot camp on the second day. So I um, spent six years in the Navy. Uh, for the first couple, I was in aviation electronics. The first couple here going to school, going to SEER school and, and uh, survival schools and A school and C school. Um, then I went over to Rhodes, Spain. I was part of an air crew, about 25 people. I was telling the pastor and some of the elders earlier that we had one Marine that flew with us, and he was supposed to guard the crypto. They didn't trust the Navy guy to guard something with their life, so they got a Marine to do it for him. And he was actually supposed to destroy the crypto when they do it. But we flew off the coast of Libya and East Germany and Russia, developing signal intelligence uh, uh, and uh, electronic intelligence, trying to map air defense systems. And uh, 
uh, you know, I was pretty much a, a, a punk when I went to service, but the service can make a 17-year-old punk into somebody who's responsible, and I appreciate what the Navy did for me. Um, after six years, I decided to get out. They, they offered me a, a great reenlistment bonus, uh, but I knew if I spent 10 years in that I would spend 20 in, and I decided not to do that. So I came to North Carolina, uh, Charlotte, which was my home before then, um, and got a job. Uh, I, I was hanging around my parents' house, and you could draw unemployment when you got out of the service there, so I was still on unemployment. But you had to go to two job interviews a week, and the first job interview I went to was with IBM. And uh, they gave me the job. I was surprised, but I worked for IBM for a few years. Um, uh, about that time, a couple years later, I started getting into sales, um, selling large computer systems. And uh, my wife actually got, got me that job. She was actually cutting somebody's hair at that time. She was a hairstylist. One of her clients was a sales manager. So he hired me, and it was very lucrative. Um, I did that for a few years, and then uh, myself and two uh, two other believers, two other uh, Christians, started a company around computer services. And um, that company uh, grew to be about 60 people. Uh, we were actually um, selling a solution to the office of CFO, um, you know, Exxon Mobil, Dick Sporting Goods, uh, Family Dollar Stores were all our clients. We were actually a boutique shop that did, we had a specific niche in the financial uh, market and everybody in the company had a degree, uh, about 75% of them had MBAs or were CPAs. And here I am, uh, a high school dropout with the GED, uh, managing sales within the organization. So, uh, uh, you know, God really has blessed me and that's one of the reasons I'm in this ministry, is the blessing that God's given to me. But, um, uh, you know, Metanoia is Greek for repentance. That's uh, what we're about as an organization. Mark Passon is the director. Mark actually was in the Army and got um, uh, arrested and was facing three life terms in prison for what he did. And um, while he was waiting for the trial to start uh, in jail, in the local county jail, he actually became a Christian and he went to his lawyer and said, I want to plead guilty. And his lawyer said, why are you, you're crazy, we, we should negotiate this. And he said, no, I am guilty. And the prosecutor, because he um, recognized what he had done, actually dropped two of the charges. Uh, he went to jail for 16 years um, and uh, was, was part of ministry in jail. Um, so he, he actually leads the organization after spending that time together. Um, there's three other regional directors. Um, I'm fairly new. I came on board right before COVID and uh, COVID hit. And uh, ministry shut down in a lot of ways. I was going to uh, Mecklenburg County Jail and teaching a Bible study on a weekly basis in the emotionally challenged um, ward of, of the uh, jail. Um, and uh, uh, trying to get into, uh, organiz to into the prisons, correctional institutions themselves uh, to support in, in prison mentoring, which is one of the things I'll talk about a little bit later, but all that shut down. So the prisons have been shut down, churches were shut down for a while. Uh, it's been an experience after being a sales guy and, and wanting to look at the numbers. Uh, my boss came up to me one time and said, Addy, how do you judge success? I said, well, the amount of prisons I get into, the amount of people who sign up for correspondence ministry. And he said, remember, Mark, ministry is more about changing you than it is you changing the world. And I think that's true in a lot of ways. And ministry has always been a blessing to me. Um, when I, I've been a ruling elder in the PCA for, for about uh, 25 years now. Um, I forgot to talk about my Christian experience. Pat and I were going to um, a church. She wanted to get married in the church. She had two children from a uh, previous marriage. Neither of us were believers. She was raised Catholic. I was raised non-church. The gospel in my family was God helps those who help themselves. And I really thought that was the gospel until, uh, until I became a Christian. Um, but uh, Pat and I went to marriage, uh, a marriage series of classes that we had to go to to get married, and God started opening up our eyes. And the first church we went to, uh, they, they weren't talking about the Bible too much, and we said, uh, why, why don't you all open the Bible? Is, is this social service month or something? They said, no, if you want to learn about the Bible, you should go up to that Presbyterian church up the street. That's how we became PCA. And uh, my, my first pastor really mentored me well. He, I'm from New Jersey originally. Um, you know, in New Jersey, the 11th commandment is not so confront often and vigorously, and in North Carolina, it's not so not confront. So 
Um, I was a pain in the neck to him in a lot of ways, but he was certainly a blessing to me and, and, and uh, gave me a real grounding in the faith. Um, but uh, where, where I got here, I, I, we sold the company in 2015, about 60 employees. I worked a two-year earn out uh, with the company that purchased us. Then I had a couple VP of sales jobs. And it was really, I, I was just uh, wrestling with this. What used to excite me didn't excite me anymore. And I felt like God was pulling me to ministry. Um, but, uh, you know, some people listen to God's still small voice. I'm a big stick Christian. He gets me with a stick and I listen. Mm -hmm. Finally, I said, okay, God, I get it. You want me to go to ministry. What do you want me to do? And the next week, I was at Uptown Church in Charlotte where one of my grandchildren was getting baptized. And um, uh, the, the uh, pastor, Tom Hawks, was preaching on um, uh, service, Christian service, and mentioned metanoia. So I called metanoia the next Monday, and I was on board a week later. So, um, I, you know, God really spoke to me, and, and I appreciate that. But there's a few other directors uh, besides myself, we're up there. Um, we are hiring more directors. We hired one more. He's not listed here in Florida. Um, it is an itineration um, ministry where, where people have to itinerate. Um, I have some funds coming in, but itineration, God's blessed me financially because of uh, the company I sold. So I don't focus on itineration. That's not uh, my major focus. So I'm happy to do this for the Lord uh, because of all he's done for me. But I, I mentioned it earlier. I think mission changes hearts. The first mission trip I was going on uh, to, uh, to Mexico, I went and thought I was doing a great thing for God. I was patting myself on the back and feeling real good about myself. And I came back changed. Um, and I realized that, that missions does uh, change us in the way that God wants us to move. So I really appreciated that. I went on uh, 10 or 12 mission trips to Mexico took most of my kids on them too. I think it's a great thing to take your kids on, on a mission trip. Um, it shows them, number one, that God is a universal God who's all over the world. Number two, that you don't have to be wealthy to have joy in Christ, which those people in Mexico don't have. Um, when you look at the criminal justice system in the United States, there's 2.4 million people in prison. Um, we by far have more imprisonment than, than any other country in the world. Um, a bunch of people on pro, uh, pro, parole and probation. But there is um, 650,000 people coming out of those pr prisons every year. And if they come out and there's been no heart change with them, the recidivism rate is 70%. So 70% of those people are going to reoffend and they're going to reoffend in our society. So we can actually impact that by using the gospel because the gospel changes people's hearts and changes the prisons themselves. And I think that's a great thing about this ministry. In North Carolina, we have uh, 65,000 prisoners in and 22,000 are released every year. Um, in, in North Carolina, in, in any state, there's really three different prison facilities. There's uh, federal uh, facilities, there's a big one, up in Butner, uh, North Carolina, the largest federal prison um, in the country uh, with 4,000 prisoners. Um, they have state prisons and then they also have local jails. In local jails, people are waiting for the trial to happen. Uh, they, that, uh, the, before the trial happens, or they're sh serving short-term sentences. So a jail would be here locally, uh, state prisons, if you look, um, that's the state prison uh, across North Carolina. They, they have uh, about 60 prisons across North Carolina that are medium security, minimum security, and, and uh, uh, high, high security. Um, and we really look to try to get from a mentoring perspective into the prisons where people are spending more time so we can change lives. Um, just brief history. Uh, we were founded to serve ex-prisoners who were addicts. That was our initial focus. We were recast as a correspondence ministry. In 2008, Mark Hassan was made the director. In 2009, we actually became part of the PCA. Part of that, we're an independent unity. Uh, the board of directors has all PCA people on it. Um, most, many of the people on the board of directors are from North Carolina. Uh, the, the vice president and the president of the ministry are both members of Christ Covenant, uh, which is in Charlotte. Um, uh, Christ Covenant supports us in a, in a remarkable way. Um, in 2012, we started Life on Life Ministry, or people actually going into prison and meeting with prisoners on a, on a bi-monthly basis. 
talk about that in a little bit. And uh, we have ministry, we have people ministering to prisoners in 49 of the 50 states. That's mainly through our correspondence ministry. Our, um, we life, life on life ministry isn't in as many prisoners. But we essentially have three core elements. Um, number one is discipleship through correspondence. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Number two is, is um, uh, church member on prisoner mentoring within the prison themselves on a bi-monthly basis. And the third part is trying to integrate those returning citizens back into churches uh, to, to firm the foundation that they have in Jesus. Um, the remote correspondence ministry, we, we work with over 5,000 prisoners in this ministry. We actually send them a, a booklet, um, and they have a corresponding partner in, in a church that has signed up for this, and there are some sign-up sheets in the back if you'd like to look at it. But it takes about an hour and a half or two hours a month. Uh, the prisoner fills this out with reform material, sends it back to, to our corporate headquarters, so it never, it never is... Uh, you, these prisoners never have your home address, and men and women, men and women can do this, and there are women prisoners we work with too. Um, but they actually fill this out, and it's sent to the, the partner, and he grades it and tests them and sends it back with personal correspondence and the next booklet. Um, they actually have a, a guide that describes the process. It's really easy to follow, and they have an answer to the test, so you. You know, so you don't have any problems answering the test. You got cheat sheets to help you. Um, that happens on a bi-monthly basis. It's really the key part of our ministry that's open right now because the prisons in North Carolina are closed. Um, but it's a great way um, to really connect with these people. You know, I always want, always wanted to look for people to disciple. You know, we're going to talk about the Great Commission a little bit later, but always wanted to look for people to disciple. And, uh, you know, never knew where to start, but this gives you the opportunity to work with somebody who wants to be a cycle, who is a, a, uh, one of the least of these in prison, and um, gives you the opportunity to help grow them in Christ. And that, I, that's a joy to me. You know, I was asking one of the pastors who actually participates in this ministry, has two correspondence partners, what he saw helped him being a pastor and having to minister to 150 people in his church. And he said he gets back to the basics. He really likes that. Um, you know, he, he doesn't deal with the basics too much, but he gets back back to the basics. And they're hungry disciples. These people are on again. The second time I went in jail, um, when I was when I was doing that uh, the uh, Bible study in jail, there was this man who had been there. Um, he, he got a drunk driving accident where the person that he was. Um, and the other car actually died. So he was facing uh, manslaughter or uh, other charges that were very serious. And his grandmother had been a, a, a Christian and talked to him about, about Christ for a lot of years. And there's a lot of Muslims, this man was a black man, there's a lot of Muslims in prison, and they were trying to get him to talk to them about the Muslim faith. But he, he had said he'd been reading the Bible for six weeks and hadn't had the opportunity to talk to anybody about it, but that he wanted to commit his life to Jesus, and we actually uh, say, you know, uh, led him to the Lord during that process. But, you know, that's the second time going to the jail, and it's just joy in bringing people to Jesus. So I, I appreciated that. But uh, this minister um, said he also has the chance to minister to people not like us. You know, often in our Christian huddles, uh, we stay within our own uh, circles, but he has that chance. But the major thing is he said that he liked, he said, he said it's exciting to see the Holy Spirit working in the inmate's life. He said, one inmate he was working with said, in prison I feel more free than I've ever felt in my life. And that is the freedom that Jesus offers us, whether we're in prison or not, the freedom from uh, that kind of lifestyle. So that's part one of the ministry, remote correspondence. Uh, number two is one-on-one -on -one in prison mentoring. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, a medium security prison that we started working with eight years ago in up, upstate Georgia. There's 420 inmates within this prison. Um, we, we launched in-prison mentoring where, it, to, to begin with, 15 people were going into prison on a bi-weekly basis, uh, trying to disciple these men and develop personal relationships with them in Christ. Uh, before COVID hit, we had 144 people going in on a bi-monthly basis. Um, talking about Jesus to these prisoners. 
Um, it really changes hearts. Um, they, they go on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. There's a waiting list right now of about 200 prisoners. So if we had people in churches that wanted to do this, we would have 200 more people in that prison. Um, the recidivism rate at Walker after five years is 2%. I told you earlier the standard of 70%. So you see how it's impacting lives and changing lives. Um, we can't do this yet in North Carolina because the prison is closed, but as soon as, they, as, soon as the prisoners uh, start again, that's going to be one of our focus areas. Um, we also do this in uh, Perry, a correctional institution in Columbia. And uh, this is from the chaplain there, and he said, I've been deeply involved in prison ministry for 30 plus years. I'm very confident and comfortable in saying that in all that time, I have never encountered any ministry or program that has had the immediate and lasting effect on the atmosphere and culture of the prison at the Metanoia Mentor Ministry. The impact is palatable and quantifiable. Um, he's worked with over 100 different ministries, and he said this changes hearts more than any other ministry. The whole feeling in the prison has changed, that, uh, you know, threats are down, violence is down, and, and people are coming to Jesus. Even Muslims are coming here because they want to have this relationship with people, um, and uh, they're, they're coming understanding that it's going to be a, a Christian-focused Bible study. Hopefully, hopefully we can... Uh, we can get that started here in, in North Carolina. Uh, the reintegration ministry is again something that I talked about briefly. Um, we try to have somebody develop a relationship with a with a uh, with an offender um, a year prior to being released. Um, there's guidelines communicated. Um, you know, we have contracts with them to make sure that the leadership of the church and the people involved are protected. Um, there's a partner assigned within the church that actually is part of the mentoring program and, and uh, make, make sure the guy understands and abide by the guideline set. And there's a contract developed. Often the parole officer are involved in the parole officer assigning it. So it's a partnership um, trying to uh, bring these men back into society and cement them in their faith. Other prison ministry opportunities, uh, you know, I was a chaplain assistant in a local jail. Uh, that's a neat, neat opportunity. All that you need to do is call a chaplain in the jail. They had four full-time chaplains in the jail in Mecklenburg County, 1,600 people there. Um, I, I met on a weekly basis, had that Bible study, uh, went on calls. If, if the, if the uh, prisoners wanted to talk to a chaplain, I went and talked to them. Um, it was really a blessing. Um, it, it, uh, Unique going into the prison cell and seeing one guard with about 100 uh, prisoners in, in one ward, one, one area. Um, but, but it's really neat. And everybody knows what you're there for. So um, it, it, I, I just thought it was a real blessing to me. Um, there's also preaching in jail and prisons. Uh, uh, if you ever want to preach or you have students that want to preach, it's a great opportunity for them. Bible studies I've talked about. Um, there's also minimum security pickup in the minimum security prisons in North Carolina and the other states. Uh, people go out to jobs, so they're not there during the week a lot of times, but on Sunday often you can pick up uh, an inmate in minimum security uh, prison, uh, bring them to church and bring them to lunch. So there's that opportunity too. These aren't directly part of Metanoia, but if your heart is for, uh, for people in prisons, I can certainly help you in any of these areas. Um, you know, what's the Bible say about prisoners? Um, you know, Paul was in chains, uh, talks about prisons a lot. Talks about the sheep and the goats in Matthew um, 25. You know, Jesus said, uh, the disciples said um, to Jesus, uh, and let me look that up for you. I mean, no ghost of escaping me at this moment. read the passage. When the Son of Man comes in glory and all the angels with him, he'll sit on the glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep and the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you are blessed by my Father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, 
and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty, you do something to drink. When we see a stranger invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you. When do we see you sick or in prison, go to visit you. The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these and brothers and sisters you did for me. So, you know, he's talking about sheep and goats, and we all know in the New Testament church we're saved by grace, not by works. But we are called to works. And Jesus said, as you treat the least of these, you treat me. So you have the opportunity in this ministry, spending an hour and a half, two hours a month, to actually come alongside people in the name of Jesus and for his sake. It also fulfills the Great Commission, which all of us know in Matthew 25, 28. Or is it 25 and 28 mixed up sometimes? But, um, great Commission to go out and create disciples. That's what you're doing here. You're creating disciples. We're in a different environment. Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, I know 15 or 20 years ago, I was sort of a legalist. I came to the PCA in a lot of ways. I tried to earn my salvation, and then God sort of broke me in my faith. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I used to think that, you know, it's our own God all business, and, and God's broken me of that. And I didn't understand these are brothers and sisters in Christ that need Jesus just as much as I did. And certainly, uh, the way he's blessed me is beyond compare, and I certainly appreciate that. I'm glad to serve you. How you can support us, uh, volunteer for um, the correspondence ministry. I've got applications in the back. Pray for us. Um, my biggest desire within this ministry is to get in prison mentoring ministry here because I think it changes hearts. Um, pray that people would get involved. You know, I think it changes uh, church members' hearts, too, uh, when they minister to people. And it's, it's such an easy way to get involved in a ministry that, that I think can have a great impact. We pray for chaplains um, and uh, within prisons that they would support us in that in-prison mentoring as the prisons open back up. Um, you can support through giving. I told you that's not my major focus, but uh, all ministries need money to survive. I, I haven't got any funds in the few years I've been here or got any, but the ministry still needs it, so I appreciate it. Um, vision for the church. You know, hopefully this, uh, you can have somebody who actually leads this vision effort within the church, but how many of your church family would like to minister the least of these and don't know how to start? How would it impact the church family to have many members ministering to the least of these in the prison? Christ's Covenant, which I told you about earlier, has about 60 people within their church that are in the correspondence ministry. Um, would your church encourage a church champion to lead your body and come alongside Metanoia? Remember the prisoners are so ashamed with those who are mistreated since you're in the body also. Closing thoughts, prisoners are forgotten population of culture. They are told by society that second chances are not for felons. Will we be the church? Will we behave counterculturally and extend the grace we desperately need in God and receive in Christ? Will we go to the least of these in Christ's name? That's all I had. Um, I'm here for questions, help in any way I can. How are, how are you on time? I forgot to bring my watch. There is, we've got about 15 minutes. Okay. Any questions? Can you talk to the content on the um, correspondence? It's really, uh, there's about um, 140 lessons. It's the basics of faith starting out, you know, really around the confession of faith is what it would be. Um, Legionnaires Ministry supplies us information for free. Um, I once was talking to a guy and when I was in Bible study and he wrote a book on, on uh, grace. And I talked to a chaplain about it and I said, um, you know, what's going on here? I think he knows more about the Bible than I do. And she said, well, he, he doesn't know how to apply it in his life, Mark. He knows how to apply it, and that's the difference. But um, it's essentially just going through all the basics and then Ligonier's. If you have a mature guy, you can start with Ligonier's, um, and you determine that by his communication. Pat started with a, a woman recently, um, and sent her first one out. Um, uh, so that's the answer. Um, I have samples of the booklets if you like to see them in the back that are for the testing. 
fun writing books though, like how has your experience matched with what you expected or what you what you were hoping to to get from being involved in something like that? Because of COVID, you said? Correct. Yeah. Um, been a bit, big disappointment. Um, you know, my uh, my goal again, you know, I, I wrote the goals down. My boss said those aren't God's goals, obviously with those goals, but um, I can't go into prisons. You know, the chaplains don't want to speak to me now because they don't have the opportunity for in prison mentoring. Um, I have, uh, you know, gotten into a lot of the prisons with correspondence ministry where I send them uh, applications for the prisoners to be involved. And that's increased steadily here in North Carolina. Uh, but the in prison mentoring, um, you know, it, it, uh, I thought at times about uh, bailing from it because, in all honesty, because uh, of, my, uh, of my frustration, but I think God wants me here. I, I really like corporate work. I mean, I enjoyed it. I had fun with it. Um, and I'm 60, uh, 65. Uh, you know, I thought about going back into the workforce, but I want to stay here and try to get in prison mentoring, but it's been a frustration. You know, I, I think any ministry's Got frustrating parts. Being an elder can be frustrating at times too. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I'm not blessed by it. I'm blessed by this. <laughs> Certainly, I think I'm circumcised by it. Uh, you know, I, I said earlier, God wants to sanctify me in the ministry as much as He wants to, me to sanct sanctify others. And uh, God does that through um, sometimes means that you know, being a big stick Christian, where you've got to take it upside and beat you up at you with the stick. Being a big stick Christian, sometimes you've got to do it through, uh, through difficult circumstances. You know, in all honesty, uh, that one man on the second time I'm in, in a jail in Mecklenburg County that wanted to know how to come to Jesus, if that's all the ministry had as part of it, uh, that would benefit God's kingdom and bless me. So I, I had frustrations, but I also had tools. Anybody else? Do you find prison and death practice are different state to state? Like, are there unique challenges that North Carolina provides that Texas prisoners uh, you know, have a different, different challenge? Or is yeah. there a similar? Uh, California has, um, I believe it's about 240,000 prisoners in it. Texas has about 150. So, North Carolina has less of a prison population than most states. Um, if you look at the demographics, it's about 40% African American, 40% white, 20% other, including Hispanics. Um, the, uh, there's other prison ministries out there. I, I actually signed up for prison fellowship a couple years before I actually became part of this ministry. And I went through all the training. Um, but it doesn't have as much a focus on Jesus' use talks about lifestyle changes. <coughs> It, it's saying essentially that as a prisoner, you've grown up in a prison environment, you need to change your thinking when you go outside and you want to be different. Uh, we focus on Jesus doing that more than uh, a rational thought process. Certainly, if they're a good ministry, I'm not saying there aren't. But there are a lot of prosperity doctrine uh, uh, people in prison ministry. So uh, that's one of the real differences is we, uh, we come from a reformed angle, where some of the people aren't reformed. That's the uh, most challenging in a lot of ways because uh, churches get fearful of it. Um, you know, we, we have a guy coming out of Walker that has been in the program uh, at Walker for about four years going through in-prison mentoring. Uh, he's also a correspondence minister, but he was a sexual offender. So that creates even more challenges. Um, but the sexual uh, offender, you can only live in certain places because you can't be, uh, I don't know what it is, 100 yards from a uh, Playground, even if it's a McDonald's playground, they got to find home uh, housing for them. You got to try to help them get a job with your contacts. Um, uh, you know, uh, got to really try to get them into church homes. So it's really a one-on-one -on -one effort with somebody leading it within churches. And it's probably our less mature of our three ministries. Um, you know, I talked to Jumpstart, which that's their whole focus in South Carolina. They don't have one in North Carolina. Or they, they actually have a housing facility they put them in and, and everything but um, you know you want those people to be in, reintegrated in the church if they go back to you know the friends and what they were doing before they're going to 
have similar outcomes in their life. Um, I haven't done, participated in it yet, um, but, but that's one of our focuses. The man there wanted to go to Christ, uh, Christ Covenant. He knew somebody at Christ Covenant. They've got a contract with them. They, they, uh, they're going to work with them to get them to church every week and help them with housing. Um, they're trying to help find them a job now. And our employers out there, Amazon, for example, who employ the rural higher ex home, you know, a lot of times uh, you have that on every application for a job. Uh, and you're being convicted of a felony. And that presents a challenge in most places you're going to go because that's just going to go to the waste basket. So we try to help them in their life to find a job. So With the correspondence industry, um, a lot of our folks aren't here for more than a couple of years. Do you stick, how long does that program last? Do you stick with somebody if you move from here to California or Northern Virginia? Yeah, certainly. There's no, uh, that's one thing nice about the correspondence ministry. There's no um, geographic focus within it. I went to a church in Raleigh and they asked us to provide a geographic focus to churches in Raleigh. We're trying to do that. Um, but there's no mandate for that. And, and all that you need to do when you change an address is call um, Shelley, who's the administrator of that program within our organization, whose, whose husband is in prison, by the way. Um, but uh, call her and she'd be happy to help you um, change the address. Because they don't go to your home address, it's very easy. You just change it in our administration office and everything changes through that. You Thank you. that there are people that are in correspondence in 49 out of 50 states. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. You mentioned that there was correspondence in 49 out of the 50 states. Yes. Which, is that uh, a correspondence? Not happening in a particular state. What state is that? Uh, that's 49, uh, 49, 49 of the prisons within the country we're communicating with prisoners within those locations. What state is missing? Huh? What state is missing? What state is what? 49 out of 50 states. Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. It's oh, okay. a good question. I, I should know that. That's my job. <laughs> and what, maybe my question why is that state not involved? It's an issue of people within the prison are communicating with us, and I don't, I don't know what, you know, we, we've had a focus, we had the national director and this regional focus, which I'm part of, it's fairly recent, um, started about four or five years ago. So there's some states where, you know, we're not sending information to them, nobody's actually uh, addressed the, the prisons within that state, trying to get them active. Um, but that's the real reason. You know, this, this federal prison up in, in uh, near Raleigh and Butner, uh, Bernie Madoff was there, you know, very high uh, exposure um, prisoners there. And that's the prison I'd really like to get into with one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, because it's, uh, it's, it would lead, I think, to a lot of other prisoners uh, embracing it. Well, thank you all. I, I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to come speak to you. We do have applications in the back of the correspondence ministry. If we get in prison mentoring and prisons near here, I, I'd certainly like uh, like the opportunity to come back and talk to people about in prison mentoring. I do have every prison uh, in North Carolina listed with the inmates and the type of facility is back in, on the table in the back with those applications. Uh, a little bit about my wife and me. We, we had a picture we went to uh, Switzerland. And I think that was in Lucerne, Switzerland, where you know, on the beautiful peak there. Um, we had a real nice vacation, and I, I was manipulative. My wife likes the beach, so we went to, first place we went was to, um, what's the name of it? I forgot. Positano, which is the picture card of Italy of the seaside village going up a cliff with all sorts of beautiful homes. And we, we had a really nice place there with uh, real big deck out on it and everything. We were there for three nights, but I'm not a beach person. So I said, huh, you know, I'd really like in Switzerland, I'd really like to go, um, uh, uh, what, what is it, hang glide? It's not hang glide. Um, I don't know, it's a place where you go on a wing and you go over. We, had, we actually were over the, over the um, uh, interlocking. It was in interlocking. And that interlocking means between two lakes and we were, Gliding over interlocking for 20 minutes at 3,500 feet above the floor. 
may ask her to do that with me, and that's not her type. And I said, I know I'm being manipulative. I'd stay here and rest on the beach for three days if you do this with me. But I picture on the uh, on the fingers from that area. So she was very brave to me. It's, um, you know, I went running in the bulls uh, in Pamplona, Spain. I, I've uh, jumped out of airplanes. I'm sort of a type A person, but she's fearful. And she was really, really brave to do that. The only the only thing is, she said she, she we we had guys that we were strapped to, and the guy I was strapped to was an Australian. who was a cute cute man. And she said, there's only one thing wrong with this flight, Mark. And I said, what? She said, I would have liked to have been strapped to that, uh, that, uh, that Australian. <laughs> I liked his accent. He was, he was light on the eyes. So. <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble for saying that. <laughs> we come close to prayer. And we'll, we'll pray. <laughs> pray for your spouse. Yeah, yeah. Before these stories get out of hand. Yeah. That's forgiving. Yeah. Father, we thank you for, uh, for Mark, for Pat for this ministry, for the work that you're doing um, among the least of these, in prisons. And, and Father, our heart typically, and, and mine certainly, is to dismiss um, individuals in prison. Uh, they're not in the front of my mind. They don't typically come across uh, my mind in a way where I'm desiring to help and serve. And yet, um, your people are there. Those that you've loved and chosen from before the foundation so move our hearts today um, to go. And that going here in this case can be just answering, um, grading some papers, writing letters, um, minimal effort. And while we don't want our goal to be minimal effort, we thank you that there are so many ways that we can serve and glorify you, that we can advance the gospel and the cause of Christ, and that we can truly see men and women as they are made new and lives change and generations change with God. So move in our hearts to respond, to go with this ministry, to continue to bless this ministry of Metanoia, provide the funds they need, the people they need. And we do pray that you would open the prisons of North Carolina. You would, we, when we think about this sickness and we think about our own inconvenience from COVID and those things, and, and here we see where, um, at least as far as our efforts are concerned, the gospel, Correct that, resolve it, take it away, heal, um, eradicate this illness, and open the prison so that we can go faithfully proclaim the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We praise you and thank you.